two, three. Bang! 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 Can forks be bent by the power of thought alone? Bend. What is the truth about mind over matter? Bend. Can metal bars be distorted without being touched? Are we in fact all born with the power to move things with our minds? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010. And now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. Among the souvenirs cluttering up my office is this key, which used to unlock the front door of my house in North London. At least it did until I met Yuri Geller. You may remember him, the young Israeli who, back in 1973, astonished everyone by his ability to bend metal. I met Yuri Geller at Birkbeck College on one of my visits to England, and frankly, I was astonished when, in front of my eyes, he apparently bent this key just by stroking it gently. Later, I wasn't so amused when I had to wake up my brother to let me into the house. Using the mind to control matter, to bend keys, as Yuri claimed, is called psychokinesis, or PK. PK seems to take many forms. The currently popular fashion is spoon bending. In California, it's all the rage at the best parties. Get a point of concentration in your head. Make it very intense. Focus it. And put it into the silverware. One, two, three. When minds think alike, the cutlery is quickly contorted. There's one, here's one, right here. All right. Oh, yeah. Here's one. Woo, look at this one, what Tammy did. Very good. Wow. And I can't force this, but if I just keep rubbing on it, it, it gets hot, and then by testing it occasionally, it just decides to bend over. Okay, well what I believe is going on is that there is a, an energy or a force that we can all tap into that science calls psychokinesis that simply has to do with the relationship between mind and matter. Melt. Bend. Then the times moved back and forth. It's easy to see. The craze began in 1973 when master metal bender Uri Geller appeared on the Dimbleby Talkins. Look, it's like it's becoming like plastic. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's, 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 breaking. It's, breaking. it's breaking. It's breaking. It's breaking. You, you can if look. It's it, it's <laughs> very. <laughs> He convinced many experts that he had paranormal powers. Later, at Longleat, the family silver suffered when Uri got hold of a spoon owned by the Marquis of Bath. This is so heavy. Yes, it's happening. It's happening. Yes, it's bad. Look, becoming yeah. there. <laughs> And there's no heat at all. T touch it. There's absolutely no heat. Is that yeah, solid yeah. silver, Lord Bar? Yeah, of course. It was made by Gerard in London. <laughs> <laughs> but Geller was not the first. The parlor psychics of the 19th century claimed PK powers that could levitate tables or make objects take off and fly around the room. 
film of Russian PK experiments reached the West in the 1960s. Alevina Gradova could apparently make a cigar tube roll about with the merest wave of her hand. Nina Kolagina was shown moving a matchbox isolated beneath a plastic cover. And under the stony-faced scrutiny of the film crew, she appeared without touching to be able to make a compass needle spin. In France, Jean-Pierre Girard claimed he could bend a steel bar just by stroking it. In Switzerland, artist Silvio Mayer bent the world's hardest currency, the Swiss franc, and in his own video showed how the spoon on the right slowly wilted when he pointed a finger. Wherever claims are made, PK generates controversy. Psychical researchers around the world are still arguing about reports from a small Missouri town named Rolla. Locksmith Ron Henson is a vital member of the team conducting the controversial PK experiments. They involve a mini laboratory designed by the Sorat Research Group, led by William Cox and John T. Richards. The mini labs are specially adapted fish tank, securely sealed, so that nothing and no one can get into it. Yet, a film camera recorded mysterious movements inside. Objects shuffled about, and paper rings linked together. Balloons went up and down like yo-yos, all apparently unaided by human hand. The most remarkable thing uh, that's happened in the mini lab, uh, from my standpoint, is the linking of rings. Solid leather rings have been seen to link. In another film, plastic rings got in on the act. Now, heat is a phenomenon that we had to contend with and this thermometer, made of plastic, was heat damaged. Not the only one that we lost in the process. And sometimes fires broke out. This balloon, as you can see, has um, been melted from some uh, inexplicable heat that occurred in the mini lab. On other occasions, balloons such as this have been seen on camera to inflate for some unknown reason. But there's no way that uh, the air could be piped in. Many lab is uh, completely sealed at that time. Paper parasols just appeared. The first parasol that appeared actually was seen by us for the first time within the mini lab standing on the sword or halberd of a plastic knife that high which had gotten inside of the mini lab itself and which has been viewed on film moving to the right. Then I placed a pen like this one on the outside of the first mini lab that Mr. Henson sealed up. I had hoped it would somehow enter, and it did. But that's what is known as direct writing, in which a pen can be seen by itself writing. It is an extremely rare phenomenon. Letters locked inside the mini lab mysteriously turn up at their destinations. This one's addressed to Arthur C. Clarke in Colombo, Sri Lanka. The researchers claim that the mini lab is a paranormal post box. This is now about to be sealed by Ron Henson, the locksmith, hopefully securely, and I mean securely. Cox insists on elaborate precautions. The keys are cut in half. Then the shanks are superglued into the locks. Something is going on, but the why of it, I have no idea. And why, if it occurs at all, it is so rare, is a mystery. Mystified they may be, but the Roller researchers are hopeful that PK Powers will spring the letter from the mini-lab, which is left to work its wonders in the clutter of Cox's garage in Roller, Missouri.
Well, the letter duly arrived here in Colombo. And there was certainly nothing supernatural about the delivery. I had no idea what this was all about. But a researcher in Cambridge, Tony Cornell, has his own ideas on the subject. We got hold of the original Sorat film and we blew it up. And uh, we had a look at it and we found, for instance, that in the ring linking, uh, which was a large feature of this, that uh, you've got the rings on the bottom here, to start with, not linked. Then suddenly you go to the next frame, and these are continuous frames, one after the other. It's suddenly linked. You go down here farther, and th these are the individual frames. You find the same thing. It's linked there, and then suddenly it shoots up to the top of the tank. There's no blurring. And we looked at these again, and we found something else that was interesting. There's a photograph here with no fish tank. There's just the bar and the lock. Same here, same here. Suddenly, here's the fish tank. It's a bit odd that this thing should suddenly be removed. Why? This led us to wonder whether perhaps uh, things were being arranged with the tank being removed, and then you start filming again. So uh, what, what we did was this. We got the camera here, the light, and the fish tank. Cornell wanted to show how simple it would be to make films like the ones from Roller. First, the rings. And we started sticking them down like that, with um, blue tank. Duck down, the chap would take a single shot. I would come up again, move it up, slightly like that. Duck down, another single frame taken with a cine camera. This is done 16 times for a second. Eventually, of course, we'd end up with several rings, and we'd move them up like this, having ducked my head down, down every, every time. And we got the thing moving around, we got the link rings by purely simply just splitting two of these, the two together. Let me give you a demonstration. There is a five, the two is solid, is moving up to there. Another frame, single shot. Then we just link it in like that. Lo and behold, there's your instantaneous linking. So simple. When we saw our film, we came to the conclusion that uh, we produced the same kind of results that we'd seen on the roller film by single-frame photography. I'd, I honestly don't know what was going on at Roller. I, when I visited there, I saw the, the uh, setup and saw the films. But uh, I can't tell you what was going on at Roller. Um, I don't myself think that it's, it's a genuine phenomena. Who's to blame? I don't know. All I can tell you is that what I saw at Roller and what we've done here has made us come to the conclusion there's no point in wasting our time with it any farther. But just suppose the mind could control matter. The implications would be tremendous. Imagine if you could explode an enemy's atom bombs merely by concentrating on the trigger mechanism. So some scientists have taken this subject seriously and have devised ingenious experiments to find the truth about PK. Stephen North's been taking part in PK experiments since childhood. At Birkbeck College London, physics professor John Hasted has been investigating Stephen's apparent ability to bend metal with his mind. In his laboratory, specially insulated from outside influences, Hasted has equipment sensitive to the smallest disturbance to metal. TV monitors ensure fair play. Stephen will try to influence an array of metal bars. Even the slightest touch will make each bar give off a different musical note. Touch uh, the right hand one, touch this one. There you are, now touch the middle one. Now the other one. Now go back to the middle one. There you are, okay. The one on the left is just a dummy, as you know. Now Stephen must try to change the notes without touching the bars. It takes time and patience, 
Professor Hasted believes that PK is unpredictable. It often happens when you really don't expect it at all. You'll get Stephen to concentrate like mad and nothing will happen whatever. And then we break the shot or have a cup of tea. I can't do it. But you see, it's surprise that's wanted. And this never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Is there something on there? Yes, there's a small deviation in there. Not bad, not bad. I was watching Stephen's hands on the monitor, so it wasn't a touch. Nevertheless, the note changed. Well, sometimes we might get a dozen of these. Two dozen, three dozen. But then again, sometimes there is nothing at all. Patience. In Wiltshire, PK is child's play. According to one theory, PK powers fade with age and should therefore be strongest in babies. <coughs> Emily's mother is putting the idea to the test with a computer, a face and a tune. Dr. Susan Blackmore. The computer will play uh, a nice tune and show a smiling face, which Emily enjoys looking at. Um, according to the output of the random number generator. So while it's running, it may do this, let's say, eight times a minute. And it, the, Emily's task is to sit there and enjoy it. And what happens is, if she's using her PK successfully, yeah. it will play more often. By influencing the output of the random number generator, she can increase the number of times it comes up. Now, you may wonder how on earth a little baby can influence the output of, of this machine, but that isn't important. What's important is that you want a particular outcome. So, you ready, Emily? Your tune will be coming up in a minute. There we go. Have a nice time. So far, we're about halfway through the experiment. And, well, it's looking quite interesting. She scored a little bit above chance, but, well, we're not at the end yet. We'll have to wait and see whether it's significant or not when we get to the end. The first time you meet PK, it seems like magic. And that's the trouble. Conjurers and stage magicians can perform the same feats, often much more entertainingly. So the problem for the scientist is to separate the trickery from the real thing, if indeed there is a real thing. James Randi, conjurer, is a scourge of the psychics. He travels the world debunking claims of PK. Randi's come to the University of California at Los Angeles to prove his case by example. In his lecture, he'll perform PK feats by trickery. For him, key bending is easy. And you might think Randi is psychic if you aren't watching his right hand. You've got two car keys. Do you drive with both hands? Or... <laughs> well, that wouldn't, wouldn't do any harm. Uh, just turn a wee bit to face the audience. And let me see your hand, the clean one. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you hold on to These two keys are identical. You hold on to one, close it in your hand like that, hold it right up where everyone can see it, and I'll hold the other one like this, and I'll stroke it, and I'll attempt to put some mental power on it to cause it to bend. Watch this carefully now. I can feel the force leaving my body, but... The he doesn't seem to be bending. Maybe that way would work. Oh, I'm afraid my attraction to you has caused a very strange thing to... Oh, there's a little bit of it. Oh, it's going a little bit, but not enough. Uh, maybe the power has transferred. Would you open up your hand for me, please? A miracle. Ladies and gentlemen, will you look at that? Well, you held it in your own hand. <laughs> that is the Uri Geller uh, key trick in one version of about 40 different versions. But Randy's best trick... Project Alpha took months to bring off. In 1979, aircraft tycoon James S. McDonnell gave half a million dollars for research to Washington University in St. Louis. They advertised for psychics, and Randy saw his chance. The most successful metal benders were Steve Shaw and Mike Edwards, who amazed the St. Louis researchers. Dr. Mark Schaefer. We have been working, first of all, to establish the range of abilities that Mike and Steve have, because 
These have apparently included being able to move small solid objects across a tabletop, influencing a variety of metal objects such as keys and silverware and metal bars and metal rods. I don't believe they're tricking us. But in 1983, after Edwards had amazed the audience at a New York press conference, Randy dropped his Project Alpha bombshell. I'm going to ask these two gentlemen a very simple, direct question. Can you tell us how do you do it? I'll do it. Be quite honest, we cheat. <laughs> so I'm uh, happy to announce that the two young gentlemen who um, took part in Project Alpha are here with us today. Gentlemen, would you uh, stand up and take a while? Steve Shaw and Michael Edwards. Project Alpha had to be done because the parapsychologists had to be taught once and for all something that they had denied all the time. They had to be taught that they could be fooled. They had said, we're too smart, we're too intelligent, we're too well-informed, we're too good observers. No one is going to be able to fool us. They were fools. Shaw and Edwards were not psychics, but conjurers. This was done by a young Japanese psychic by the name of Masawaki Kyota. He would take a spoon, hold it like this, Michael, you must be a psychic. And causing that to twist 180 degrees, just like that. They fooled the researchers with standard conjuring tricks. Here we go. Watch out. But most of all, by distracting their attention. <laughs> all I use is just sleight of hand and misdirection and psychology. When the Mac Lab first started testing us, I would go through a process and then of, of trying to do something and failing. Then I would go back in and watch the videotapes, which was very good feedback. I could see what I could get away with and what I couldn't. Uh, I noticed that one of the cameramen that was watching my hands very close up was very good. So what I would do to get him off the camera, I realized, hey, he's good at what he does. I failed on a number of tricks, set one up that was ready to go, had a spoon pre-bent and was just covering it, letting no one look at it. Ask for the cameraman to come and be used as my subject. Obviously, a lesser trained person is going to have to take the camera. That was it. That was the whole key right there. In essence, physically, the only way to bend a spoon is to bend it like that. But you've got to do it at the but right But you've got moment. to do it at the right time. And that's one of the problems that scientists have when they're trying to judge this. They set up the experiment to start at 4 o'clock. The trick may have been done at 3.15. I can show you something that will show you exactly how the misdirection takes place. It's not psychic, but it's very, it's, it's, we'll give you a good idea of exactly what I'm talking about. Would you come over here, please? I'd like you to sit in this chair for one second, please. Just for a second. Are you ready? Yeah. Now, I want you to watch very carefully. Which hand is that in? I don't know. <laughs> it's in that hand, it's in that hand. Now, you gotta watch carefully, you're not gonna see what happens. Which hand? It's not in either, you see? You're not watching where it's going. Now, if you don't watch, you're not going to see. Now, watch. Which hand? <laughs> see, it's just simple misdirection. I make her see what I want her to see. And now, I... everyone else has seen where it went. Exactly what I was doing. Everybody else here saw where it went. I was throwing them over your head. <laughs> I must admit that I was quite impressed when Yuri Geller bent my key. But that was 10 years ago. And although many people still believe in PK, Personally, I'm not convinced. And why should it exist? After all, there are much easier ways of bending spoons, even keys, with a little effort. And you know, if people could really spirit objects out of closed containers merely by thinking about them, surely by this time, spies and bank robbers would have perfected the technique. Yet if there's one thing we've learned from PK research is this. The scientists are the easiest people to fool. And there's a very good reason for this. Scientists study nature. And nature never cheats. But some people do. They bend the evidence. 
And that's something that scientists often forget. Next week, Strange Powers, The Verdict.